<laughs> well, are you ready? We're looking for a new governor. Amen. Yeah. We're looking for somebody that is a strong fiscal conservative. We're looking for somebody who's a fighter, who understands what it means to fight for the liberty of the people that he represents. And we're looking for somebody, I can't say who's left all his hair on the floor of the, <laughs> of the stuff, so I won't say that. But we're looking for a man that will honor his oath of office. Please welcome our second, uh, he served two terms, he's in his second term. Welcome Dave Thompson to the podium. Give a big, big round of applause. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me here tonight. And uh, they're not giving themselves credit, but Jack and Jake spend a ton of time at the State Fair. Let's give them a hand. Huh? I was out there a lot. I stopped by their booth many times, and people were there, people were talking, people were get, showing their concern about what's going on in the state and what's going on in this country. Folks, right now we've got a confidence deficit. We've got people that are concerned about the future. And you know, it's interesting, we hear all of the economic data that we get spun out of uh, Washington, D.C., and out of St. Paul, for that matter. People trying to convince us that everything is all right. How many of you here believe everything is all right? We don't believe that. And you know, I believe in the people. I believe in the regular folks. I believe in all of us. I'm a regular person. You're regular people. That's what's made this country great. And we have a general sense that things aren't right. Now, why do we feel that way? Well, I think the first couple of speakers that went on with some a little academic training here could answer that for us, and that would be uh, Jake and Dave. I mean, you've got Dave talking about how this system is supposed to operate, that people are supposed to control the government rather than the government controlling the people. You've got uh, Jake showing us what a significant financial problem that we're in nationally. And I think most of us have the sense that something's not right with that. Now we look at what went on in St. Paul starting this last January with the DFL governor and the Democratic legislature. Let's talk about that a little bit. We got over $2.1 billion in new taxes, over $3.1 billion in new spending, more than 8% growth in our budget. How many of you here had 8% growth in your salary or in your business? If you did, thank God, because you're in a small minority. Most people are working hard to hang on right now. Most people are concerned about their future, the future of their children, and their ability to retire with some level of security and comfort. So let's talk about what we need to do. First off, we need to put the individual back in charge of our government. We need to put the individual back in charge of their own lives. And we need to have a healthy economy. Now folks, I want to talk a little bit about optimism. A little bit about believing in the American people. A little bit about believing in the people of Minnesota. You know, I, I, I wasn't talking about this when I started campaigning on June 26, but I'm talking about it now. This governor and the Democrats, it has hit me. What they do is they pit certain groups of Minnesotans against others. And it drains the human spirit. Because the fact of the matter is, we as Americans believe not in envy, not in strife, not in looking at your employer or your employees, the bad guy. But we believe that high tide raises all boats, that as we grow the economy and as we have a healthy economy, that employees prosper, employers prosper, wealthy people prosper, poor people do better, the middle class does better, and we develop a stronger middle class. That's not the message that you get from this governor. The message you get from this governor is we gotta whack the top 1% or 2% or whoever the whipping boy of the day is. It's not optimism. It's not a belief that we're all in this together. It's a sense that we're in competition, that if I get something, you've lost something. And I think it's really important to understand that that's not what our economy does. We can create wealth. We can create higher standards of living. We can all be better off. We can all improve our lot in life and enjoy things more today than we have in the past. We've got a confidence deficit. We need more good-paying, full-time jobs that make people want to come to Minnesota and stay in Minnesota. 
We want employers to want to come here because we've created an environment in which they can make a profit and do well and take care of their families and pay their employees rather than having to go on secret missions overseas to try to give special favors to individual businesses to drag them in here because we have so damaged the regulatory and tax climate that businesses don't just want to come here naturally. We've got to get that fixed and I can tell you that if I'm your governor, we're going to take those signs leading into North Dakota that say open for business and turn them around and say welcome back. Because we don't believe they're the bad guys. I find it astonishing that this governor has been able to essentially get along in life without having to earn a living himself because of the wealth created by his predecessor and then condemns the very system that allowed his father to do it. We need to restore that system. We need to restore freedom, liberty, economic prosperity, and we can do it. How do we do it? Number one, we cut our regulatory system down dramatically. We don't look at every businessman and woman as somebody who is trying to destroy the state or destroy our air, or destroy our water, or destroy the farmland. We look at them as individuals, which 99% are, that are trying to deliver a good product, a good quality service or good to people so that people's lives are better. And we allow them to do their thing. We create a tax climate in which we are simply taxing people in a way that drags the least on the economy and we're doing it for the purpose of generating the revenue we need to run government, not social engineering. Government should not be in the business of driving people's behavior. People ought to be making decisions on an individual basis as to how they're going to run their own lives and government ought to get out of the way. Now let's talk about the gift tax and the estate tax. Wall Street Journal says we have about the worst climate in America for retirees. Isn't that wonderful? We have people that give of their whole lives working hard, contributing to our economy, paying taxes to sustain our educational system, to do all of the other things that we need to run this state and run this government. And what do we do when they finally get to the point that they can retire and presumably enjoy some of the fruits of their labor? We tax them to death while they're alive, and then once they die, we tax them more. Why would we do that? It's ridiculous. We need to create an environment in which people Maybe they want to leave here for the climate, but hopefully not the tax climate. How about we change that and make Minnesota a welcoming place? Now, in order for you to do well in that economy, you've got to have a good education. I want to talk about that a little bit before I close. I am the product of public education. I graduated from East Grand Forks High School. I went on to the University of North Dakota as an undergraduate, lived at home. Saved some money so that I had enough money to go to law school, came down here, went to the University of Minnesota. I've gone to school my entire life in the public schools. But the fact of the matter is we've got a problem. Not everybody in this state now has access to a good education. And I'm going to tell you, much of it is dependent upon your socioeconomic status and it disproportionately impacts minorities, people of color. And you know what the Democrats do? They turn the other way because to really change things will disappoint the unions. And how do the Democrats win elections? I think it's the civil rights issue of the 21st century, folks. Are we gonna throw a bunch of our children to the wolves and not allow them to have the true access to the opportunity that we in Minnesota wanna give our children? I don't think we should do that. Now, what does that mean? What that means is true choice. Now, I'm a big fan of charter schools, of open enrollment. But I am boldly arguing that we need to do a real choice program. I like tuition tax credits. And I believe that if you are a parent and you have a child in one of our schools that is graduating 50% of your students, and 50% of them can't read at grade level, you should have a way out whether or not you have Mark Dayton's money. And the bottom line is the only way that we can do that is to take some of the money going into some of the public schools that are not doing well and give it to parents. Because you know what? Money ought to support children, not bricks and mortar. By the way, I have my wife Rhonda with me tonight who is quickly becoming more popular on the campaign trail than I am, but I don't think she's gonna run. And I tell you that because she happens to be a licensed public school teacher. 
and she teaches, uh, she's, she's a substitute teacher, stays busy almost every day. My sister's a school teacher. My mother, my late mother, was a school teacher. As I said, I'm a product of the public schools. But folks, iron sharpens iron. We've got to have competition. And there's another thing that that would accomplish. Right now, we have one ideology, one way of thinking that is dominating our public schools, and it's the left. And the fact of the matter is what we want is we want people to be able to send their children to all kinds of different schools. And we certainly want people to be able to send their children to schools where they're going to learn the basics of the Constitution like Dave talked about tonight. That they're maybe going to hear about the budget deficits that Jake talked about tonight. So that's it, folks. It really isn't complicated. We simply need to get government out of the way. We need to create a healthy economy through lower taxes, lower regulation, and putting the individual on top. And we need to create better schools by forcing them to perform or potentially lose the, the, some of the students that they have. Now, people say to me, don't you think this will damage the public schools? I have two comments on that. And I don't believe it necessarily will. Because I happen to believe that iron sharpens iron and the public schools will respond. But secondly, let me ask you this question, and it's a moral one as much as an education one. Do we have public schools to, to perpetuate public schools? Or do we have public schools to take care of children? And if you answer the latter, then you have to put the well-being of the student ahead of the well-being of the system. I ask you to do that, and finally, I will return to my optimism theme. This is a great country. It's a great state. I would love to have the time to sit down and hear every story out here, because I know that you all have a unique experience in this state. Maybe many of you have experiences from other states. And you've done something unique to contribute to this great society that we live in. And America is an unbelievable experiment of individualism and freedom and liberty. And I'm running for governor, and I ask your support because I want to continue that. By the way, my sign-up sheet is over on a table over there. You can sign up to get my email updates, etc. My website is teamthompsonmn.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Thompson for Gov. I respectfully ask for your support. Those of you who are active in the uh, BPOUs, I will abide by the endorsement. I appreciate uh, the people who built this party. I appreciate your time. I look forward to seeing you many more times along the campaign trail. Have a great night. Jack asked if I take questions. And we'll take two. Time, that's fine. All right, two questions. Make them easy one, please. Yes. What's his name? Hey, what's, hi, Senator Thompson. How you doing? Doing well. Uh, I like your idea about school choice. I'm wondering uh, how do we uh, open that up so that we can use state funds to allow children to attend uh, Christian schools? Great question. The gentleman asked, for those of you who may not have been able to hear, how do we uh, allow ourselves to be able to use state funds for people to attend Christian schools? Actually, constitutionally, we can't. And that is why I prefer a tuition tax credit system, because uh, you've probably heard the two most common choice systems are vouchers, where you, uh, you know, a parent would get a specific amount of money, for lack of a better term, that they could use on school. That has been deemed a subsidy to the school and is oftentimes challenged constitutionally. A tax credit, on the other hand, is considered a subsidy to the individual, and then that individual can spend it how they want. Now, the one problem with tuition tax credits, and an often, often a follow-up question I'll get is, well, what about families that don't have enough income that they can take advantage of a tax credit and use that to, to go to a, a private school? The answer is, states that have done this successfully have set up uh, a system where businesses or, or uh, wealthy individuals can contribute uh, to a fund that creates tax credit money and they get a dollar for dollar or perhaps a 90% tax credit. So it's a win-win-win. The business gets to help out and they're, they're, they're viewed positively from a societal standpoint, they're helping out. The child gets into a better school and uh, it, it, in the end it, it, doesn't, it doesn't cost the state money. So that, that's, that's how we do it. I believe in a tuition tax credit system to, to avoid the voucher problem that you've alluded to. One more. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, Dave, how do you feel about Common Core? Uh, the question was, how do I feel about Common Core? I oppose it. 
Um, I, I don't like it for a few reasons. Number one, I'm very concerned about some of the uh, standards, particularly the areas of social studies and that sort of thing. Secondly, I just recently read an article indicating that it's very process-oriented instead of outcome-oriented. In other words, if you get the wrong answer to the math problem, but you have a good reason why you did, that's okay. That's not okay. I don't believe that. Finally, um, I am a believer that we should not have a one-size-fits-all education system, whether it's testing, whether it's curriculum, no matter what it is. I don't believe that uh, members of Congress, or for that matter, Common Core is really more state-generated. I don't believe that the governor of California or the governor of Florida has a better idea on how a child in Lakeville or Warroad or East Grand Forks or Minneapolis should be educated than we do. So I'm generally philosophically opposed to anything that comes from some nationalized kind of standard because I think we ought to be in control of our own education system. And by the way, don't ever believe the government when they tell you, we're going to do this to you and suggest that you do it this way and we're going to give you money, but we're not going to control it. Don't ever believe that. Always the next step behind dictating standards, they'll control everything. So the fact of the matter is, it's the same way with funding. The government funds things, they ultimately want to control it. So, in a word, I oppose it. Thank you very much. Give David a round of applause. Thank you. Jake,